Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. Would you like to start with yours? Uh, why don't we start with yours? Okay. We're actually doing something a little bit different. This podcast is all about engagement and it's all about being easy for people who are not the people we're interviewing to understand. And so sometimes we've got keywords here and there that might throw you for a loop. These intros are just to have a bit of a chat about why we're talking about what we're talking about. Today, we're talking about my research. Since we are talking about your research, what is it? I lived in the States for a while. And before I left, I had to get my, my immunization record. So the jabs I'd had. And I went to the doctors to ask for my records and they didn't have any record for me. And I just felt, I, that what am I meant to do if the people who are meant to look after my information don't have it? This happened aged like 10 years ago, and I'm still salty. It's really had an effect on how I think about privacy. When I say privacy, how can I share data, but also how can I restrict it and hide it from people who don't need to see it? Power to the people, really. What's interesting to me is how the way that we try and do privacy, the way that we try and control how data is used, just doesn't really work. And part of the reason is that it's so inflexible. Paper forms don't quite translate to an online space. I mean, I mean, part of the people is always good. Are there any terms you want to define ahead of time? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. When I talk about privacy, what I mean is controlling what is known about you in a, in a fairly reasonable way. You can get a bit paranoid. As a security person, I do tend to. Back in the day, there were some lawyers in America, Warren and Brandeis. They were part of a fairly elite group and got really annoyed by the paparazzi taking photos of them. They really didn't like that. And so they wrote this whole thing about the right to privacy, the right to control what is known about me. There's a whole history of different takes people have on it. What I like to think about is choice. I talk a lot about informed consent. <laughs> there are loads of cookies online and they're really annoying, but apparently these are consent notices and it's all about having informed consent. We rarely sort of stop to really think about what does it mean to be informed, right, before you actually agree to something. Yeah, I mean, po point being is that informed consent is meant to like, help people, keep them safe. And the way that we do it, it just sort of gets in the way. We need to do better and make it more of a conversation, not just a, a one-time tick box. The stuff we'll talk about is part of a much wider conversation about how we talk about data, how we talk about data use and how to protect it. Let's go ahead and get into the interview that you, that you and I recorded. Welcome, Ari. Hello. Would you please... Give me and the listeners your overview. There are some misconceptions that we have about people. In security, you may hear users are the problem, they're the weakest link, insert, you know, derisory metaphor here. And it places the blame squarely on the shoulders of the people who have the least power to do anything about it. This is something that I'm trying to find evidence either for or against, because we make the claim and... We don't really back that up. I've been looking at how we architect choice. So how we offer people options. I've been collaborating with a medical online research platform, and I've been looking at how they architect choice for the people who take part in their study. Now, this is important because in research, informed consent is something that we researchers use to protect people. You offer a description of the work you want to do to a potential participant. They say yes or no. When they sign off and say yes, you can then collect their data for your research. Now, what I did in my work, there were three parts to it. In the first stage, I interviewed people taking part in and the research team who designed, developed and maintain a research study. It's an online platform. They collect data on rare genetic conditions. And what I found was that researchers, it was an excellent team very engaged, very switched on. They had participant interests at heart and wanted to protect them and help them and support them. They had a little focus group where they asked for advice. But when I talked to the participants, they didn't know what was going on. And they had a lot of very interesting assumptions around how researchers would use their data. They said, yes, I'll take part, but they didn't expect to hear anything back. The second stage of my research was trying to improve that. I just asked participants what they wanted to hear. And they told me part three was building it. I worked with software developers. I worked with the research team and we just, we made it happen. Then we looked at whether that changed how people shared data. The thing we measured was the number of questionnaires that the study asked people to fill out against the number of questionnaires they received back. We found that the drop-off in participation was reduced. 
which suggests that if you do listen to people, if you do respond to what they want, they're more likely to stick with you, which I think is something really important when you're talking about how you share data, how you operate online, how you build systems and how you architect choice. So there you go. Very succinct. Bearing that in mind, I'm curious if you could expound a little bit on what it means for consent to be informed. Yeah, for sure. Informed consent practices are data protection practices. After World War II, there had been terrible things happening to people in the name of medical research. There was a series of trials in which war criminals were held to account. And as a response, medical researchers were told informed consent is how we're going to show that people have agreed to take part and that you've told them about the potential risks. You've told them about what's involved and they knowingly have come to agree to this. It is freely given, so you're not coercing people. It is informed and it is voluntary. It's very important. You haven't forced them to make that decision. Informed consent has its problems. Sometimes once you give your consent, you can't actually change it. People are often overloaded with lots of rather technical information. And when you start looking at those decisions made online, pre-existing problems are further compounded by things like People aren't familiar with digital technologies. They find it hard to use. It really adds up. If you look at what consent looks like online, it'll be cookie notices. Claudine, I don't know if you come across these, but I come across them every single day on every single website. And they're really annoying because they overload me with information. I can never, I've never once been able to revisit a choice I've made. I just want to look at my kitten videos. Calling this informed consent just doesn't fit it doesn't work so informed consent is broken online it doesn't work i'm trying to think of how we can do better and there's a theory called dynamic consent it's flexible you can change your mind over time it's a theory so there's not a lot of work that supports it or refutes it the people i work with have implemented dynamic consent that's why i wanted to work with them I tried to do a service evaluation. I wanted to explore something new. The system we have isn't really working. That's how consent plays into all this because it's a safeguard and there is room for improvement. What drew you to that topic specifically? We have a right to privacy in the home, but what does the home look like online? If you're connected to people all over the world, where do the boundaries sit? Sort of Nissenbaum, there are people who try and figure out how you can model privacy, how you can think about it practically when you're building technology. I'm someone who works with computers a lot and I'm frustrated by the fact that I have to give someone in a shop my email just to get my receipt. Like that's, that shouldn't be the case. Absolutely. Based on what you said before about interviews that you conducted, go into what you found people thought about privacy and eroding privacy in in the digital space. It's not like we ever had total privacy and we've had less and less of it and now we have no privacy. It's more like we've normalized having a lack of privacy. There's a really great quote that talks about how when we, you know, early internet had browsers in 1995, implemented a, a decline all cookies as a default option then most websites would have responded with designs that didn't need cookies, that didn't seek personal data. The way that we've developed stuff has led to this point, and it's going to take a bit of energy to to try and knock people off of that track. Once you've done your theory work and your academic work, you have to have some kind of output. Annie Rood was talking about his toolkit. For app developers, I've got something that I could hand to a researcher who are themselves building an online study, and they could use that to think about what data they want from participants and how they demonstrate that that data is being used for the purposes of research. Currently, in a research study, I can use a template that has a share or not share. And if someone doesn't want to share their data with me, I don't see them again. And if they do, I don't have to tell them anything after that point. There are other options. There are various choices you can offer people. For example, are you happy for me to share your data with my colleagues, pharmaceutical companies? There are different levels that people would like to have choice over. And that's what I found from these interviews. They trusted researchers to do the right thing, but they also expressed they would revoke consent if the researcher had done a bad thing or if they felt that what they had contributed towards was of no benefit. Those are the only two conditions under which someone might take back consent, but none of them ever did. So there's this implicit trust in researchers as experts. If you, if we can do a better job, then we absolutely should. And we have responsibility to do so. In re- no, but I, I think it is a little bit frightening that there is such implicit trust in researchers. 
you know, given that the research world has not been immune from its own ethical scandals and, and you know, breaches of ethics over the years. I'm also curious about what the biggest surprise has been for you in the course of conducting your research. It was these underlying directives. So like the people I interviewed, they thought that they also had a duty to be truthful, to be accurate, to provide information that would be as perfect as possible to support the research. It's not that people don't take this seriously or they don't want to engage. It's like there's so many underlying assumptions or decisions being made and we just don't think about them. We don't see them. This idea that privacy is linked with one's essence as a human being. It's a way for people to express choices. We researchers, not just researchers, experts in other, other fields, they can be people who make software, people who make policy decisions, whoever seem to assume that people are stupid and we do not take time to communicate what we want to do in terms people can understand. People have jobs, they have time restrictions, energy constraints, and it's the expert, so my job, to communicate what I want to do in a way they can understand. So it's a truly informed choice. The, the findings that, you know, that I wasn't surprised by, but the findings that came out was that people expected so much but they never voiced that. Yeah, it is. What I'm hearing for you is, is that there also seems to be, is that the notion of transparency seems to be going hand in hand with the notion of privacy. Exactly. Uh, one of the duties that people thought researchers had to protect data, this is entirely cybersecurity related. People thought researchers should make them feel safe, combine safety and security, these two threads, into protecting their personal information. So they talked about confidentiality and anonymity of data, information security, that was important to them. Most of all, it was that the researchers had been considerate. So the consideration and protection of data includes these security measures like access control, uh, update your, your tech. It was also much more about the researcher as a person, that they were honest, that they were reliable. About 2015, there was a hospital that made an agreement with a, a big tech company. So for anyone who knows it, it'll be the Royal Free but, and Google. But for anyone who isn't familiar with the story, that's, that's totally fine. What happened was they decided to work on an app together. It would look at your symptoms and help predict whether people had a serious condition that needed treatment. But what they did was they didn't really have a data agreement in place. And what a data agreement is, it says, as a hospital, we'll provide this, you know, as a tech company, we'll, we'll do that. And we have this all out there before anything bad happens. What we generally do is test on information that is not live, that is not being used right now for, for something important like care in an emergency ward. The app that they made was tested on live patient data that was bad. The UK, the Information Commissioner's Office, that's an office that look at situations and make a ruling on whether or not the way that data was used was legal. And they said, no, this is, this is bad. Doctors have a duty of care to their patients. I like to think about this idea of a duty of care as a security person. I have a duty to care for data that people entrust to me. And if I do things that damage that trust, it's on me to show that I'm trustworthy. It's not on people giving me their data to, to do anything. It's, it's up to them who they want to place their trust in. I, I've seen ethics pr processes and people, they can take a while, they can be frustrating, but ultimately at the end of the day, the reason we do this is so that we don't cause harm. We shouldn't be wanting to take shortcuts. And so what I try and do is make this ethical thing easier for researchers to do by giving them a bit of a roadmap. You don't need to be an expert in ethics. Think about what you want from your participants, because that can be your research data. But look, they also have perspectives of their own. They might be able to help you with, with the work or provide ideas. They might not, but look for that input and then filter it later. And once you've done this inclusive work, you have to have responsive work where you provide feedback, where you show that you're trustworthy, that you're worth the trust that people have put in you as a researcher. You know, which is a bit touchy-feely, but very, very important. And I would like to make it easier for other people to do work that demonstrates that trustworthiness as well. Developing that, um, that roadmap that you discussed for researchers, did you, uh, did you hit any major speed bumps in that development? Oh, yeah, totally. So it was going to be a long, very involved experiment. We didn't have time, so we just did it all at once. The work lacks granularity. And then, then the pandemic hit. So 
again, there's lots of different ways that this work can branch out, but I just, I did what I could and hopefully other people take it on, but it's the lessons I've learned from this are definitely something that I will take on to whatever I do next. And what do you think some of the most important lessons you've learned from it are? You have to listen to people. I, as the expert researcher, build a research study for people to take part in. I have to think about how I'm including people, how I'm listening to their input and receiving it, and how I can feedback. Let's take informed consent, weave it into the research process so that you have this relationship over time with people. And that can be quite intensive as well, resource-wise. But if you don't put that in place, people can never express what they want to or something that might actually help you. My collaborators, they have this patient forum and people taking part in the study came up to them and said, okay, so you're studying rare conditions. I have a rare genetic condition. Have you ever thought about the mental health component, not just the, the physical parts of these things? And then my collaborators did that. They've learned from their participants in addition to doing the work they set out to do. That makes your data collection much more valuable by having that context. Not only do you receive the information about symptoms, you also get this information about people's lives and conditions under which they have to operate. And uh, yeah, it's all good stuff. It's really easy to get bogged down sometimes in the more in the technical minutiae of things and, and forget that actually a lot of the research that we're doing is for people and it's for users in whatever condition that might be and that we need to listen to them and, and pay attention to their needs as opposed to just telling them like, no, this is this is what you need yeah, and it can be a lot, but I've been a software developer. I know you can apply this to that kind of work. For example, when you build some software or hardware or whatever, do some user testing, which means identify who is going to use this, invite a few people in to like have a go, and you can really iron out what you've got and identify problems earlier that would be much more expensive to fix later. Yeah, it's, it's very much an everybody wins type of situation, right? It's more laborious potentially, but it's, it's, it just benefits everyone in the long run. Bearing all of that in mind, um, if you had infinite resources, whatever resources might mean, what is the one big question that you would like to um, investigate or the one problem you would like to solve? It's all about culture. How do we build cultures in which people feel comfortable bringing ideas, bringing mistakes, their experiences? It's very much about leadership. As a cybersecurity person, I have to lead the work that I do because I'm not an expert in lots of different subjects, but what my job is, is to bring people who are experts into the room. The expert that so many of us miss out is the user. In my research, it was the patients or participants. They had such a wealth of information and knowledge and experience. My collaborators had used, they had leveraged that experience and it had worked out for them. It was, it was valuable. If I had all the resources, I would scale that up. How do we communicate effectively? How do we build those relationships? It's not that I would expect every person in a study I'm running to want to call me on my mobile every evening just to check in. It's just about having that architecture in place, having that system in place where people can tell you information or they feel that you value them. And as a result, they are more likely to come forward with information that might help you. So it's pretty abstract, I realize. In terms of cybersecurity experts, it's about fostering leadership and knowing who to include as part of the initial conversations for not cybersecurity people. How do you equip them to be a bit braver, I guess? How do you equip them with tools that they can then use in spaces that I will never have access to? So it's all about advocacy. How do I, what do people need to be security advocates or data protection advocates elsewhere? Bit of a step away from my research, but I think it's all about not me being the expert in the room. It's about me helping other people figure out how security is relevant and useful to them, and then how they can weave that into the work that they do. What resources would you, what cybersecurity resources would you recommend people follow? If you have social media, I only have Twitter. So I'm at Shoelight. We can post it in the show notes. I get to see people's thoughts who I wouldn't normally have access to. If you are not someone who likes to use social media, the register is a really good, uh, they do articles, they keep, you can keep up to date with tech news and stuff like that. So you can branch out from there. In case you didn't catch it, Ari's Twitter handle is at Shoelight. So please follow her. She posts very interesting things. I do. Um, <laughs> yes, you do. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime, you can tweet at us at HelloPTNPod, 
and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.